First off, I want to thank my friend from Oregon and to recognize the substantial leadership he has shown on this issue over the years. Long before I came to the Intelligence Committee and long before Edward Snowden began to steal documents, Senator Wyden, along with Senator Mark Udall and others, were doing everything they could without disclosing classified information to shine a light on the fact that the U.S. government was collecting massive volumes of data on millions of law-abiding American citizens. My friend from Oregon deserves our thanks for that leadership. Now, after the bulk call data collection program was revealed to the public, the government, frankly, defended it, and defended it vigorously. It took a number of months for the intelligence community and the rest of the administration to take a deep breath and that. really assess whether bulk metadata collection was necessary, whether it was effective, and to consider whether there were other, less intrusive, more constitutionally grounded ways to accomplish these same goals. Starting with the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies, the admi administration began to agree that, quote, some of the authorities that were expanded or created in the aftermath of September 11 unduly sacrificed fundamental interests in individual liberty, personal privacy, and democratic governance, unquote. And they recommended changing those authorities in order to, quote, strike a better balance between the competing interests in providing for the common defense and securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, end quote. Following that, multiple efforts have been made to update and reform FISA and to update and reform the USA Patriot Act. None of those have been successful. But now we are forced to come to a resolution through a combination of, frankly, procrastination, and I think misguided hope that the American people would look the other way while the government continued to vacuum up and store their personal information and data as part of a program that even the intelligence community acknowledges can be accomplished through less intrusive means. I'll be honest, Mr. President, the current USA Freedom Act isn't what I consider perfect. For example, I'd prefer it include strong reform of Section 702 collection. But I accept that circumstances require us to be pragmatic, require us to govern and move forward, and to work with one another in both parties to find compromise. That's what the USA Freedom Act is. It's a product of bipartisan compromise. That's why it passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 338 to 88. And let's be blunt, many of those who voted against it didn't do so because they support bulk collection. They did so because they want to see Section 215 wither and die in its entirety. That's the political reality that we face today. And we need to accept it rather than demanding a continuation of a program that the appeals court has determined is illegal. I thank my colleague for his statement and would just want to explore this a little bit uh, further. I hope that those who are following this debate understand that my colleague from New Mexico, a real rising star here in the, in the Senate, he and I would like the USA Freedom Act to go further. And we both work together on legislation that would make additional reforms. And certainly our colleagues on the Intelligence uh, Committee and here in the Senate can expect to see us continuing to work together to advance these additional reforms over the coming months and years. And for now, the two of us are saying we ought to support the USA Freedom Act and then move on, move on to other critical areas. I particularly want to see closed what's called the backdoor search loophole, which my colleague from New Mexico 
talked about. What this means, colleagues, is that when you are engaged in a lawful search of someone who is a threat overseas pursuant to Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, very often Americans, law-abiding Americans, can get swept up in this search and have their emails looked at. This is a problem today, and my view is it is likely to be a growing concern in the future because increasingly communication systems around the world are becoming globally integrated, so the amount of email that is reviewed of Americans is likely to grow. But we can't get that change here tonight. And so, as my colleague from New Mexico has uh, mentioned, the USA Freedom Act would make several worthwhile reforms, such as increasing transparency, reducing the government's reliance on secret law. But from my perspective, the centerpiece uh, of it is ending the bulk collection of Americans' information under the Patriot Act. I have been trying to close this particular loophole for close to a decade now. Now, some of our colleagues have said that the bulk collection has never been abused. No one's rights have been violated. My own view is, and I'm going to ask what my colleague thinks, is vacuuming up all of this information, particularly when databases get violated all the time. We've seen historically instances where there's been improper conduct by the government. I believe that dragnet surveillance violates the rights of millions of our people every day. Vacuuming up the private phone records of millions of Americans with no connection to wrongdoing is simply a violation of their rights. And vacuuming up Americans' email records, which I pointed out before my colleague came to the floor, which he and Senator, our former colleague, Senator Udall, and I battled, that sure is a violation of the rights of Americans as well. And colleagues, that wouldn't have been pointed out at all. Wouldn't have been pointed out at all unless Senator Udall and I, with the help of our friend from New Mexico, hadn't been pushing back on it. And finally, one day, the government said, well, we'll get rid of it because it wasn't effective. They got rid of it because they saw they were going to get hard questions, the kinds of questions my friend from New Mexico has been uh, asking. Now, with respect to the legality of this uh, program, I know my colleague and I actually filed a legal brief, along with our former colleague Mark Udall, when the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit was examining in that, pro that program. And in our brief, it was our view that we were able to uh, debunk many of the claims that have been made about the effectiveness of the program. And I think it would be helpful if my colleague from New Mexico laid out some of that analysis here uh, tonight. I would ask the senator from New Mexico to begin, and I would encourage him to start by addressing the claim that the bulk collection of Americans' phone records is essential for stopping terrorist attacks. My question to my colleague is, is there any evidence, any real concrete evidence that supports that claim? I want to thank my friend from Oregon and, and begin by saying that despite what you may have heard by talking heads on the uh, Sunday shows and on the cable news networks, that the answer is no, there is simply not evidence to support those claims. And when this mass surveillance was first revealed to the public two years ago, the executive branch initially responded to questions like this by claiming that various post 9-11 authorities had resulted in the thwarting of approximately, quote, 54 terrorist events in the U.S. homeland and abroad, unquote. Now, a number of us, including my friend from Oregon, uh, my former colleague from uh, Colorado, Senator Udall, began to pull on that thread to really parse down and see just what the executive was, was talking about. And first, of those 54 terrorist events, 
it turned out that only 13 were actually focused in the United States. But more importantly, those numbers conflated, conflated multiple different programs, including authorities under Section 215 and different authorities under Section 702. In June, uh, actually on June 19th of 2013, my colleague from Oregon and Senator Udall pointed out that, quote, it appears that the bulk phone records collection program under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act played little or no role in most of these disruptions, saying that these programs have disrupted, quote, dozens of potential terrorist plots, unquote, is misleading if the bulk phone records collection program is actually providing little or no unique value. Of the original 54 instances that the executive branch pointed to, every one of them crumbled under scrutiny. None of them actually justified the continued existence of the bulk collection program. I'm going to take a moment with the indulgence of our colleagues and read uh, what was written by Judge Leon of the District Court for the District of Columbia when he ruled in the Clayman versus Obama case. This is a little bit long, but I think it's important that this be part of the official record of this debate. Judge Leon writes, the government does not cite a single instance in which analysis of the NSA's bulk metadata collection actually stopped an imminent attack or otherwise aided the government in achieving any objective that was time sensitive in nature. In fact, none of the three recent episodes cited by the government that supposedly illustrate the role that telephony metadata analysis can play in preventing and protecting against terrorist attacks involved any apparent urgency. He writes that in the first example, the FBI learned of a terrorist plot that was, quote, still in its early stages, unquote, and investigated that plot before turning to the metadata to ensure that all potential connections were identified. Assistant Director Hawley does not say that the metadata revealed any new information, much less time-sensitive information, that had not already come to light in the investigation up to that point. The judge continues, in the second example, it appears that the metadata analysis was used only after the terrorist was arrested to establish his foreign ties and to put them in context with his US-based planning efforts. And in the third, the metadata analysis, quote, revealed a previously unknown number for a co-conspirator and corroborated this connection to the target of the investigation, as well as to other US-based extremists. Again, writes Judge Leon, there is no indication that these revelations were immediately useful or that they prevented an impending attack. Assistant Director Hawley even concedes that bulk metadata analysis only, quote, sometimes provides information earlier than the FBI's other investigative methods and techniques. Unquote. Finally, Judge Leon writes that given the limited record before me at this point in the litigation, most notably the utter lack of evidence that a terrorist attack has ever been prevented because of searching the NSA database and that it was faster than other investigative tactics, I have serious doubts about the efficacy of the metadata collection program as a means of conducting time-sensitive investigations in cases involving imminent threats of terrorism. That is where the, the judge leaves off. And I would turn back to the senator from Oregon to address the three cases that we discussed in more detail in our amicus brief to the Second Circuit. I thank uh, my, my colleague. The first of these examples, and they really are the kind of overblown examples about the effectiveness of, of bulk collection is the case of an individual named Najib, Najibullah Zazi. And Mr. Zazi was a known terrorism suspect, and a number of people have suggested that bulk phone records collection was somehow essential to stopping him. 
because a query of the bulk phone records database for numbers linked to Mr. Zazi returned a previously unknown number belonging to another terrorism suspect. However, since the government had already identified Zazi as a terrorism suspect prior to querying the bulk phone records database, it had all the evidence it needed to obtain the phone records of Zazi and his associates using an individualized Section 215 order or other legal authorities. In the second case, some have pointed to Mr. Moalan, a San Diego man convicted of sending $8,500 to support al-Shabaab in Somalia. The intelligence community has indicated that information from the bulk phone records database, quote, established a connection between a phone number known to be used by an extremist overseas and an unknown San Diego-based number that belonged to Mr. Moalan. Yet there are ample existing authorities under which the United States can conduct surveillance on a phone number known to be used by an extremist overseas and other phone numbers in contact with that phone number. The argument that Mr. Moalan's case is an example of the unique value of bulk phone records collection is just not accurate. And my view is this is yet another case that offers a misleading exaggeration with respect to the effectiveness of bulk phone record collection. Finally, several supporters of the bulk metadata program have claimed that, and I quote, if we had the bulk phone records program in place at the time of the September 11, 2001 attacks, we would have been able to identify the phone number of one of the hijackers, Khalid al-Midar. Just as in these other cases, however, the record indicates that Mr. Midar's phone number could also have been obtained by the government using a variety of alternate means. Before September 11th, the government was surveilling a safe house in Yemen, but failed to realize that Mr. Midar, who was in contact with the safe house, was actually inside the United States. The government could have used any number of authorities to determine whether anyone in our country was in contact with the safe house that it was already targeting, it didn't need a record of every American's phone calls to establish that simple connection. I'd like to expound on that point a little bit, Senator Wyden, about the many other ways that the government can legitimately acquire the phone records of terrorism suspects, because I think it's a very important point to understand the tools that already exist that have been very effective and have proven themselves over time. There are actually a number of legal authorities that can get the same information without the government collecting billions of call records, billions of call records that in large part uh, belong to innocent Americans. For example, the Stored Communications Act permits the government to obtain precisely the same call records that are now acquired through bulk collection under Section 215 when they are, quote, relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation, unquote. Additionally, national security letters, which I would point out do not require a court order, can also be used by the government to obtain call records for intelligence purposes. Further, the government can also acquire telephone, telephony metadata on a real-time basis by obtaining orders from either regular federal courts or the FISC for the installation of pen registers or trap and trace devices. And finally, individualized orders for phone records as opposed to orders authorizing broad bulk collection can also be obtained under Section 215. I think those of us early in this debate thought that that was what was going to occur under the Patriot Act in the first place. But that is what the USA Freedom Act seeks to require while prohibiting the bulk collection of millions of personal records. It even includes emergency authorization authority for the government to get records prior to getting court approval, subject to later court approval in an emergency. The government can use many of these authorities without any more evidence than what it currently requires to use the bulk 
phone records database, with less impact, I would point out, on the privacy interests of millions of innocent Americans. So I think at this point, the senator from Oregon and I have laid out our case as to why this dragnet bulk surveillance program fails to make our country measurably safer and why it should end. And I'm pleased to say that a number of people have finally come around to our way of thinking on this. I thank my colleague, and I think that I'd like to wrap up with just a couple of points and then give uh, the last word to uh, my friend uh, from New Mexico on, on this subject. He's absolutely right that some of the most authoritative leaders in our country, experts on, on terror, have reached the same judgment that we have. I made mention of the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications you know, Technologies. And I really would encourage colleagues who are following this debate and citizens across the country at reports available online, available in our office, page 104 of that report is very, very explicit. It says that the information that would otherwise be obtained through collecting all of these phone records, millions and millions of phone records on law-abiding Americans, people like Mike Morrell, former acting director of the CIA, and Richard Clark, who served in two administrations, they said it could have been obtained through conventional processes. This is a program that is not making us safer, and it is not my judgment that ought to be the last word. It should be that of people like I have just quoted. And I'll go on to say the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board report on the phone records program said pretty much the same thing. I quote here, Section 215 has shown minimal value in safeguarding the nation from terrorism based on the information provided to the board, including classified briefings and documentation. We have not identified a single instance involving a threat to our country in which the program made a concrete difference in the outcome of a counter-terror inquiry. And I think I'll close by way of saying, and I touched on this before my friend from New Mexico arrived, I would like to do a lot more than I believe is likely to happen here quickly in the United States Senate. I do want us to see us finally throw in the dustbin of history this bulk phone records collection program because it doesn't make us safer and it compromises our liberty. But as I indicated to my friend from New Mexico, I'd also like to close this backdoor search loophole in the FISA Act, which is going to be a bigger problem in the days ahead, given the evolution of communication systems and how they become globally integrated. And I'll close by way of saying one of the most important issues, the most important issues we are going to have to tackle in the days ahead is going to deal with encryption. And encryption, of, of course, is the encoding of data and messages so that they cannot be easily read. The reason that this will be an enormously important issue, and my colleague and I have talked about this, is because of the NSA overreach, the collection of all of these phone records on law-abiding people. A lot of our most innovative, cutting-edge companies have found their customers raising real questions about whether their products can be used safely. And a lot of the contracts and purchasers who buy their products around the world are saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't trust them. Maybe we should try to start taking control over their servers and have local storage requirements and that sort of thing. So what our companies did, because they saw the effect of the overreach by the NSA, they started to use encryption to protect the data and messages uh, of the consumers who buy their products. Now, most recently, the head of the FBI, Mr. Comey, has said, rather than to try to come back with a solution 
that protected both our privacy and our security, he said that he was interested in requiring companies to build weaknesses into their products. Just think about that one. Requiring companies to build weaknesses into their products so the government, which in effect caused this problem with a overreach, in effect, rather than trying to find a solution that worked for both security and liberty, said, we'll just start talking about requiring companies to actually build weaknesses into their uh, products. I and others have pointed out, once you do that, hang on to your hat, because when the good guys have the keys, that's one thing. But when companies are required to build weaknesses into their products, the bad guys are going to get the keys in a hurry, too. And with all the cyber hacking and the risks we already have, we ought to be really, really careful going where Mr. Comey, our FBI director, has proposed going. But that's not for tonight. Tonight is not an occasion where we'll be able on a bipartisan basis to close the backdoor search loophole or we'll be able to come up with a sensible policy with respect to encryption rather than requiring companies to actually build weaknesses in their products. We're not going to be able to do that tonight. But we will have a chance here in the United States Senate now to take steps that have been bipartisan have been bipartisan both here in the Senate, here in the other body in the House of Representatives to end the bulk phone record collection program because it doesn't make us safer and it threatens our liberty. And I always like to close by thinking about Ben Franklin, who said anybody who gives up their liberty to have security really doesn't deserve either. And I am so pleased to have a chance to serve with my colleague from New Mexico on the Intelligence Committee who is going to be a thoughtful advocate for these kinds of policies, in my view, for many years uh, to come. I thank him for his involvement tonight and would be happy to give him the last word of our uh, colloquy at this time. I yield to my colleague. Well, I want to thank my friend from Oregon. And I think you could not have chosen a uh, more appropriate way to end than to reference what Ben Franklin said so many years ago, that great quote that those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And while many reforms still lie in front of us, I think as we move forward to approving the USA Freedom Act, we move a lot closer to the balance that Ben Franklin articulated so well over 200 years ago. And I look forward to working with my colleague uh, from Oregon and all of our colleagues to achieving that balance and standing up for our constituents. <laughs>